Let's look at Acts chapter 10, verse 22. I titled this, Good Things Happen. I don't know what happened to my title. Um, Good things happen when we as the church uh, understand what our needs are. And so we're going to look into that today. It says, And they said Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an angel to send for thee into this, his house and to hear these words. Then called he them and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and his friends, And Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. Verse 26, but Peter took him up saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he walked and talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or common to one another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man uncommon or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, and soon as I was sent for, I asked thee for what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, Thy prayer is heard, and thine alms have had been remembrance of the sight of God. Verse 32. And send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the sea, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Do you guys see what's happening here? You see what's happening here? It's, it's making known to us that we are accepted. Amen? The word which God sent unto his children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. That word I say ye, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he hath done in the land of Jews in the Jerusalem, whom they slew and hung on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that is which has ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead, to give him the prophet's witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision and believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that of the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these which should be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Lord, I love you for your word. And I thank you, God, that you give it to us to instruct us to demonstrate to us, Father, the importance of our lives in living with you. And God, I pray that today you'll use this servant in some way to bring a message that you've prepared for our hearts. And God, that you will speak through me, not with my words, but yours, Lord. May it ever be etched on our heart in Jesus' name. And the people said, amen. You may be seated. 
I love to talk about good things. I get excited about God. I get excited when I think about what God is doing here in our church. This morning in Sunday school, I got to meet with our ushers and greeters, and we talked about what, how important it is to be a part of the family of God and have an opportunity to serve and further his kingdom. We're committed here in our church that we are going to find the lost and the hurting that's in the world. We're going to bring them in. They're going to be a part of our church. We are then going to teach them, teach them the Bible, teach them to know Jesus, have them have an understanding of his word, and then we're going to send them to serve. We're going to prepare people to do God's work. That's what we're about. And so we want to find in every way that we're doing that. Part of that is for us to understand the needs of the church. The church has some very clear needs, and it's important for us to gather them in our heart and understand them. The first one we see here in verse 24 through 33, it says the church needs unity. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We talked about unity in the church. If a church is not unified, it will do great. If a church is not unified, it will do great harm to the kingdom of God. You see, that means we're quarreling with one another. That means that when we're not unified, that we're not in one spirit. That we think that we can all lead and we can all do it better than the next person. It means that we're critical of those around us. Because unity means that we're all in one accord. That we are all seeing the vision of what God has called us to do as a church. And when I talked to the group this morning, I reminded them of the reasons we are here. We're not here to be a country club. We're not here to have a great time. I love barbecues. You can tell by looking at me, I like them. You can tell that I like parties. Cinco de Mayo, I wasn't here Friday night because of another commitment. But I love that time together. I love our cafe. Nobody likes a donut better than me. And so I love the opportunity to be together and to enjoy one another's company and to have fellowship with one another. But I want you to know there's more than just having a good time. There's more to it for us. We are called according to his word and we are called to reach the hurting and the lost people of our community. And so we must be in one accord about that. We must be central focused on what we're doing. We must set in our hearts that no matter what comes against us, no matter what weight we bear, we will be called to that great calling we are going to see the lost saved and the hurting helped. I want to be that city placed on a hill. I want to be on top, not because I want a name or because I want popularity. I want it there because I want to be where every sick, hurting person can see us and know there is hope right there. I want New Life Assembly to be a place of unity where we love one another and we've got each other's back. So that if we're in the supermarket and someone says something negative about one of us in this church, we come to the defense and we stand up for one another. That's unity. It was recognizing here, and we see it in the scriptures, that they were recognizing that not anyone was unclean or unworthy or unacceptable to Jesus Christ. Jesus' ministry was to teach and love people. It was to save the people, to tell them of what was to come in the future. My job is to tell us that we have a responsibility to be in unity as a church. That means that we get behind our leadership. We get behind our Sunday school teachers. We get behind every single ministry we have, and we pour ourselves into it. You know, there's a a great movement that's going on among the church. And I'm excited about it. Not just our church, but churches across the country. There is a great movement when people are realizing that church has to be more than something you do once a week. It's got to be a part of your life every day. If you only come in once a week, you're just getting a very small sample of what your world and what your life can be. But when you live it every single day, 
When you realize that you are called out from among, when you realize that you have been marked by Jesus Christ himself, he has put a calling on you. You recognize that and you unify with the other believers. God has great things. Unification means that the desire to win souls take precedence over our petty differences. When Peter entered Cornelius' house, there was a large crowd, but God had showed him to not call any man unpure or unclean. See, Cornelius proclaimed that all are in the presence of God and to listen to everything the Lord had commanded Peter to tell them. See, God had already prepared hearts. That's what he does. God had prepared them to hear Cornelius in, and to hear Peter in a way that it would penetrate their heart because the Holy Spirit had gone before and done the work. And if we stay in unity and we pray together and we see the same vision and we have the same purpose in our hearts, then God will go and send the Holy Spirit to prepare man's hearts to hear it. And you say, well, pastor, how will they know? You know, people in the community are not church people. Well, they will know because when they come in, the Holy Spirit would have already drawn them here. And then all we're doing is fulfilling our part in what God wants to happen. Cornelius proclaimed this and he told them to look for it. They were ready. Second point this morning is found in 34 through 43. The church needs Biblical instruction. We need to know what God's word says. We got to read it. We got to meditate on it. We got to spend time with it. And we need Sunday school classes that teach it. It's okay to be focused on some fun activities in Sunday school. I'm all for it. I had a lot of fun when I was in Sunday school. Some was sanctioned and some was not. But I had a good time. It made me want to go because I was learning something. I was being taught something that spoke to my innermost man. It spoke to me as a child and said, what you're hearing is right. Follow it. Follow it. We need people in our church that will stand up for what's right and what's wrong. You see, I heard some of you say, well, pastor, you preached an old time message last week about heaven and hell. <laughs> it wasn't an old time message. It was a current day message. It was not a message of yesterday. It was the message of today. Heaven and hell is real. And we must be about God's call in our life. We must seize every single moment in our life for the kingdom of God. Now you can say, well, pastor, we're busy. You know, we got a lot going on. I told the ushers and greeters this morning, I'm not paying you. You'll get no pay for this job. But someday, someday, when you walk into the kingdom of heaven, the payday has been paid. You have been receiving money in your bank account. You have received gold and riches and rubies and diamonds. You have received much more than you can ever imagine when you walk into that place someday. You know what? The money here is going to rot. You know what? There's a move in our world right now that the money you hold in your pocket doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. And so it's all going to go away. You better start putting some treasures in heaven. You better start paying it forward to heaven because in that time you will wake up and you will see in the presence of God that it was worth it all. Whatever you had to sacrifice, it was worth it all. People are tired of going to church and receiving book reports. They're tired of going to church and just hearing a feel-good message. What people are looking for is the truth. There's a hunger in our heart that only God's word can fill. There is something within us that only he can do.
And I'm telling you this morning that when you get into the word of God, it will jump from the pages and it will become real to your heart and to your life. Every single week we come in here for Bible study. And do you know I walk out of here every single week different than when I came in? You say, well, you're the pastor. You should know it all. You know what I have found out about the word of God? It is so vast and expanse that I learn from hearing you and what God has done in your life through the word of God. And when I listen to it, I learn something about my life. That's how mighty the power of God is. That is how wonderful it is when we read those words and we hear it applied in people's lives. It becomes a testimony of what God can do in our lives. We need good biblical teaching. Peter stands up and tells the people that he now realizes God doesn't show favoritism. How important for us to understand God doesn't care how much money you have. God doesn't care how popular you are. God doesn't care what kind of car you drove in here today. He does not care one bit. The only thing he cares about is is your heart. Is your heart open to receive what he wants to give us today? And what he wants to give us today is fresher than last week's because it's today's. What he did last week, I've already lived on it. It already fed me through the week. I need what is today, what's tomorrow, what is going to be next time that I'm in his presence. That's what I want. I want to understand how his word comes alive to me and it becomes the breath of life for me. God has commanded that we preach this to the people, telling them that Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. See, Jesus is the only standard by which we stand. If you look at me, you've got a very simple standard. I'm just telling you. I'm, I'm unrighteous. Somebody told me this morning, Pastor, you know the problem with you, you're just too truthful. (laughs) Well, that might be true, but you need to understand, I'm no better than you. I'm no better than you. I've been called out. I've been marked. I have been called to be accountable. But you know what? I fail and I stumble. And so I can't be your standard, but Jesus Christ is your standard. And you understand that standard when you're in his word, when you understand the character of God and who he is. When you understand Jesus, you will see that you are the most important thing in his life. Nothing else matters. You matter. You matter. And I love it when I can see someone come into the realization that they are loved and they are cared about. Last night we were here and I praise God for our, over, our, our Proverbs 7 and Overcomers ministry. We were here and a young lady came and Cheryl brought her to me and, and gave me the opportunity to pray with her. And I remember looking at her and she said to me, I've got to dig up all of those things in the past and get forgiveness for them. And I said, you know what? You leave them there because the enemy wants to beat you down with them. You tell Jesus, please forgive me and cleanse me from all those things. And guess what? His word promises me that he does it. He takes every single one of those things. The Bible tells me he buries them in the deepest sea, never to be remembered again. And I am thankful for that. I am thankful that when I stand before him, he has already made intercession for me. Amen. In verse 44 through 48, the church needs the Holy Spirit. I love walking into this church and sensing the feeling of the Holy Spirit. And I know that the Holy Spirit is here. You know why? Because before I roll out of that bed, my wife said last night, she said, man, you did a lot of talking in the night. Well, I remember what I was doing. It was praying. Now she was sleeping so hard, she couldn't tell who I was talking to. But I was talking to God and I was telling him, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Lord, I don't want to go in that place and it just be my responsibility to get up and say something positive or motivating or encouraging. I want my role, God, to only be there to be an active part of the Holy Spirit's movement. 
Holy Spirit, you come. You prepare the hearts of people to receive the message. You do the work, Holy Spirit. So when I walked in here this morning, I had no greater expectation than the Holy Spirit had already been here. He'd already begun to deal with people's hearts. He was doing his work. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on that place. Oh, how mighty it must have been. Oh, how mighty it must have been to know and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit move across the place. You know, one time I sang in this choir and there was about 175 of us and we were down in Beaumont, Texas and we were singing. We were all the way from home. All of our inhibitions were gone. We were just there to praise God. And we stood in this big choir stand and we were up there singing and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came in and I mean, we went like dominoes. There wasn't a one of us standing. We didn't plan it. We didn't have any idea it was going to happen. But when the Holy Spirit came in, it was so heavy. You say, well, how's the Spirit just take over your body? Well, the Spirit doesn't take over your body. The Spirit won't fight you for what you're not willing to give up. But if you're willing and you're ready and you're saying, Holy Spirit, take over, and that Holy Spirit comes in and you're able to recognize it, I'm telling you, sometimes you cannot stand. Sometimes you cannot stand. The presence of God is so much mighty and so powerful. He hasn't changed people. He hasn't changed. The thing that has changed is us. <laughs> it's us. Are we coming with that kind of expectation that the Holy Spirit is already here and he's prepared us so that when we get ready to worship, it's full and glorious. We don't care if, if everything's perfect. We don't care if every, the sound comes on or the siren sounds or whatever. We are ready to worship and we are lost in it. See, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. The thing I know about the Holy Spirit is when he shows up, there's a difference. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit comes, things begin to happen. It doesn't stay the same. When the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit is active and you are responding to the Spirit of God, it's not the same. If you are still the same, you haven't accepted it because the Holy Spirit changes. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit was given to us as boldness to bear witness of Jesus Christ. And so when that Holy Spirit comes on us, we got to tell somebody. We got to say it. We got to jump. We got to shout. We got to do something. We can't just sit there. I know, I told the group this morning, some of us have got our bum bums molded into those pads on those seats. And they're just our seat and it's just molded right. My bum bums changes every week. And so mine doesn't mold to these seats. And that's why I can jump. That's why I can shout. That's why I can stand up and move because I'm not stuck to those seats. Because the Holy Spirit is moving and the Holy Spirit is doing something in us. Peter then baptized these Gentiles. You think it's controversial when your pastor gets a little flippy tongue <laughs> in church. When your pastor tells you the bad things he does, you think that's controversial? It was controversial in that time, what was going on. But Peter didn't care because God had spoke to him. God had showed him God had spoke to him that he was to go. He was called out for a purpose. Man, if we could get a hold of the purpose, if we could get a hold of what God is saying to us this morning. As Peter learned that day, the Holy Spirit is for everyone everyone. I don't care what your culture is. I don't care what your pedigree is. I don't care what church you grew up in. The Holy Spirit is fresh and it's real and it wants you. It wants to take control. It wants to give you a boldness. It wants to give you an anointing from on high. It wants to move in your life and bring convicting power. It wants to be a guide and a deliverance of you. And we have to be ready to accept that in our life. 
There's no perfect church. I've been to a lot of them. There's not one of them perfect. Some of the biggest and brightest churches there are, there's still bad people in them. I've been in a few lately. Boy, we talk and we hear how great and how wonderful they are. And then I've asked somebody for help and they were mean and rude to me. Now, you might say it might be just because of me. <laughs> but bad people exist in every church. Every church, there's not perfect. If this was a perfect place, they wouldn't have let me in the back door. They certainly wouldn't have paid me to come here because we're not perfect. God uses people like us to do his work. The unperfect. The ones that are cleansed by him. The ones that are called by him. The ones that are anointed in his spirit. You can look and search all you want, but we need unity. We need a Bible instruction and we need the move of the Holy Spirit. That's the needs of our church today. When you pray, pray those things. Lord, bring unity among us. Lord, will you ensure that we are taught from the Bible and it's a convicting power of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, would you fill us with that infilling of the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. We need it in church today. Amen. God has called this church out from among. Wherever I am in this community, I will run into someone and they already know about us. They know something's going on over here. Let's not disappoint them. This morning, I encourage you, let's not disappoint them. Let's show them the excitement. Let's show them what God is doing. The Bible says that wherever there are signs and wonders, people will go. They will seek after that because they want to see the manifestation of God himself. People are tired of not seeing Jesus in our churches. People are longing for reality. They're longing for the real look of Jesus. And we're it. When I stand on that parking lot last night and I see big old Josh, who just a couple years ago in prison, I see Josh leading us as an MC. I look at that and I think the Holy Spirit's real. I looked around there last night and I don't know some of the people in community, but somebody said to me, see that one? That's one of our major troublemakers in our community and they're here tonight. You know what? God's doing something. God's doing something. Because why, why, would, why would those people want to be here among us? You know why? Because the Holy Spirit He's drawing them in. He's drawing them in. The work may seem hard, but when you couple it with the Holy Spirit, with Bible instruction, and with unity, God has got this under control.